This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Kristen Hughes. The Amateur Cracksman by E. W. Horning. To A. C. D. This Form of Flattery. The Ides of March. Part One. It was half past twelve when I returned to the Albany as a last desperate resort. The scene of my disaster was much as I had left it. The baccarat counters still strewed the table, with the empty glasses and the loaded ashtrays. A window had been opened to let the smoke out, and was letting in the fog instead. Raffles himself had merely discarded his dining jacket for one of his innumerable blazers. Yet he arched his eyebrows as though I had dragged him from his bed. "'Forgotten something?' said he, when he saw me on his mat. "'No,' said I, pushing past him without ceremony, and I led the way into his rooms with an impudence amazing to myself. "'Not come back for your revenge, have you? Because I'm afraid I can't give it to you single-handed. I was sorry myself that the others—' We were face to face by his fireside, and I cut him short. "'Raffles,' said I, "'you may well be surprised at my coming back in this way, and at this hour. I hardly know you. I was never in your rooms before to-night, but I fagged for you at school, and you said you remembered me. Of course, that's no excuse. But will you listen to me for two minutes?' In my emotion I had at first to struggle for every word, but his face reassured me as I went on, and I was not mistaken in its expression. "'Certainly, my dear man,' said he. "'As many minutes as you like. Have a Sullivan and sit down.' And he handed me his silver cigarette-case. "'No,' said I, finding a full voice as I shook my head. "'No, I won't smoke, and I won't sit down, thank you. Nor will you ask me to do either when you've heard what I have to say.' "'Really?' said he, lighting his own cigarette with one clear blue eye upon me. "'How do you know?' "'Because you'll probably show me the door,' I cried bitterly. "'And you will be justified in doing it. But it's no use beating about the bush. You know I dropped over two hundred just now.' He nodded. I hadn't the money in my pocket. I remember. But I had my check-book, and I wrote each of you a check at that desk. Well? Not one of them was worth the paper it was written on, Raffles. I am overdrawn already at my bank. Surely only for the moment. No, I have spent everything. But somebody told me you were so well off. I heard you had come in for money. So I did, three years ago. It has been my curse. Now it's all gone, every penny. Yes, I've been a fool. There never was nor will be such a fool as I've been. Isn't this enough for you? Why don't you turn me out? He was walking up and down with a very long face instead. Couldn't your people do anything? He asked at length. Thank God, I cried. I have no people. I was an only child. I came in for everything there was. My one comfort is that they're gone and will never know. I cast myself into a chair and hid my face. Raffles continued to pace the rich carpet that was of a piece with everything else in his rooms. There was no variation in his soft and even footfalls. "'You used to be a literary little cuss,' he said at length. "'Didn't you edit the mag before you left? Anyway, I recollect fagging you to do my verses. And literature of all sorts is the very thing nowadays. Any fool can make a living at it.' I shook my head. "'Any fool couldn't write off my debts,' said I. "'Then you have a flat somewhere,' he went on. "'Yes, in Mount Street.' "'Well, what about the furniture?' I laughed aloud in my misery. "'There has been a bill of sale on every stick for months.' And at that Raffles stood still, with raised eyebrows and stern eyes, that I could meet the better now that he knew the worst. Then, with a shrug, he resumed his walk, and for some minutes neither of us spoke. But in his handsome, unmoved face I read my fate and death warrant, 
and with every breath I cursed my folly and my cowardice in coming to him at all. Because he had been kind to me at school, when he was captain of the eleven and I his fag, I had dared to look for kindness from him now, because I was ruined and he rich enough to play cricket all the summer and do nothing for the rest of the year. I had fatuously counted on his mercy, his sympathy, his help. Yes, I had relied on him in my heart, for all my outward diffidence and humility, and I was rightly served. There was as little of mercy as of sympathy in that curling nostril, that rigid jaw, that cold blue eye which never glanced my way. I caught up my hat. I blundered to my feet. I would have gone without a word, but Raffles stood between me and the door. "'Where are you going?' said he. "'That's my business,' I replied. "'I won't trouble you any more.' "'Then how am I to help you?' "'I didn't ask your help.' "'Then why come to me?' "'Why, indeed,' I echoed. "'Will you let me pass?' "'Not until you tell me where you are going and what you mean to do.' "'Can't you guess?' I cried, and for many seconds we stood staring in each other's eyes. "'Have you got the pluck?' said he, breaking the spell in a tone so cynical that it brought my last drop of blood to the boil. "'You shall see,' said I, as I stepped back and whipped the pistol from my overcoat pocket. "'Now, will you let me pass, or shall I do it here?' The barrel touched my temple, and my thumb the trigger. Mad with excitement as I was, ruined, dishonoured, and now finally determined to make an end of my misspent life, my only surprise to this day is that I did not do so then and there. The despicable satisfaction of involving another in one's destruction added its miserable appeal to my baser egoism. And had fear or horror flown to my companion's face, I shudder to think I might have died diabolically happy with that look for my last impious consolation. It was the look that came instead which held my hand. Neither fear nor horror were in it. Only wonder, admiration, and such a measure of pleased expectancy as caused me, after all, to pocket my revolver with an oath. "'You devil!' I said. "'I believe you wanted me to do it!' "'Not quite,' was the reply, made with a little start and a change of colour that came too late. "'To tell you the truth, though, I half thought you meant it.' and I was never more fascinated in my life. I never dreamt you had such stuff in you, Bunny. No, I'm hanged if I will let you go now. And you'd better not try that game again, for you won't catch me stand and look on a second time. We must think of some way out of the mess. I had no idea you were a chap of that sort. There, let me have the gun. One of his hands fell kindly on my shoulder while the other slipped into my overcoat pocket, and I suffered him to deprive me of my weapon without a murmur. Nor was this simply because Raffles had the subtle power of making himself irresistible at will. He was beyond comparison the most masterful man whom I have ever known. Yet my acquiescence was due to more than the mere subjection of the weaker nature to the stronger. The forlorn hope which had brought me to the Albany was turned as by magic into an almost staggering sense of safety. Raffles would help me after all. A. J. Raffles would be my friend. It was as though all the world had come round suddenly to my side. So far, therefore, from resisting his action, I caught and clasped his hand with a fervour as uncontrollable as the frenzy which had preceded it. "'God bless you!' I cried. Forgive me for everything. I will tell you the truth. I did think you might help me in my extremity. Though I well knew that I had no claim upon you, still, for the old school's sake, the sake of old times, I thought you might give me another chance. If you wouldn't, I meant to blow out my brains, and will still if you change your mind. In truth, I feared that it was changing with his expression even as I spoke and in spite of his kindly tone and kindlier use of my old school nickname, his next words showed me my mistake. "'What a boy it is for jumping to conclusions! I have my vices, Bunny, but backing and filling is not one of them. Sit down, my good fellow, and have a cigarette to soothe your nerves.' 
I insist. Whiskey? The worst thing for you. Here's some coffee that I was brewing when you came in. Now listen to me. You speak of another chance. What do you mean? Another chance at Baccarat? Not if I know it. You think the luck must turn. Suppose it didn't. We should only have made bad worse. No, my dear chap, you've plunged enough. Do you put yourself in my hands, or do you not? Very well. Then you plunge no more. And I undertake not to present my cheque. Unfortunately, there are the other men. And still more unfortunately, Bunny, I'm as hard up at this moment as you are yourself. It was my turn to stare at Raffles. You? I vociferated. You? Hard up? How am I to sit here and believe that? Did I refuse to believe it of you? He returned, smiling. And with your own experience, do you think that because a fellow has rooms in this place, and belongs to a club or two, and plays a little cricket, he must necessarily have a balance at the bank? I tell you, my dear man, that at this moment I'm as hard up as you ever were. I have nothing but my wits to live on, absolutely nothing else. It was as necessary for me to win some money this evening as it was for you. We're in the same boat, Bunny. We'd better pull together. Together? I jumped at it. I'll do anything in this world for you, Raffles, I said. If you really mean that you won't give me away, think of anything you like and I'll do it. I was a desperate man when I came here, and I'm just as desperate now. I don't mind what I do if only I can get out of this without a scandal. Again I see him, leaning back in one of the luxurious chairs with which his room was furnished. I see his indolent, athletic figure, his pale, sharp, clean-shaven features, his curly black hair, his strong, unscrupulous mouth, and again I feel the clear beam of his wonderful eye, cold and luminous as a star, shining into my brain, sifting the very secrets of my heart. "'I wonder if you mean all that,' he said at length. "'You do in your present mood, but who can back his mood to last? Still, there's hope when a chap takes that tone. Now I think of it, too, you were a plucky little devil at school.' You once did me a rather good turn, I recollect. Remember it, Bunny? Well, wait a bit, and perhaps I'll be able to do you a better one. Give me time to think." He got up, lit a fresh cigarette, and fell to pacing the room once more, but with a slower and more thoughtful step, and for a much longer period than before. Twice he stopped at my chair, as though on the point of speaking but each time he checked himself and resumed his stride in silence. Once he threw up the window, which he had shut some time since, and stood for some moments leaning out into the fog which filled the Albany courtyard. Meanwhile a clock on the chimney-piece struck one, and one again for the half-hour, without a word between us. Yet I not only kept my chair with patience, but I acquired an incongruous equanimity in that half-hour. Insensibly I had shifted my burden to the broad shoulders of this splendid friend, and my thoughts wandered with my eyes as the minutes passed. The room was the good-sized square one with the folding doors, the marble mantelpiece, and the gloomy old-fashioned distinction peculiar to the Albany. It was charmingly furnished and arranged, with the right amount of negligence and the right amount of taste. What struck me most, however, was the absence of the usual insignia of a cricketer's den. Instead of the conventional rack of war-worn bats, a carved oak bookcase, with every shelf in a litter, filled the better part of one wall. And where I looked for cricketing groups, I found reproductions of such works as Love and Death and the Blessed Damoiselle in dusty frames and different parallels. The man might have been a minor poet instead of an athlete of the first water but there had always been a fine streak of aestheticism in his complex composition. Some of these very pictures I had myself dusted in his study at school, and they set me thinking of yet another of his many sides, and of the little incident to which he had just referred. 
everybody knows how largely the tone of a public school depends on that of the eleven, and on the character of the captain of cricket in particular. And I have never heard it denied that in A. J. Raffles's time our tone was good, or that such influence as he troubled to exert was on the side of the angels. Yet it was whispered in the school that he was in the habit of parading the town at night in loud checks and a false beard. It was whispered and disbelieved. I alone knew it for a fact, for night after night I had pulled the rope up after him when the rest of the dormitory were asleep, and kept awake by the hour to let it down again on a given signal. Well, one night he was overbold and within an ace of ignominious expulsion in the heyday of his fame consummate daring, an extraordinary nerve on his part, aided doubtless by some little presence of mind on mine, averted the untoward result, and no more need be said of a discreditable incident. But I cannot pretend to have forgotten it in throwing myself on this man's mercy in my desperation, and I was wondering how much of his leniency was owing to the fact that Raffles had not forgotten it either, when he stopped and stood over my chair once more. "'I've been thinking of that night we had the narrow squeak,' he began. "'Why do you start?' "'I was thinking of it, too,' he smiled, as though he had read my thoughts. "'Well, you were the right sort of little beggar then, Bunny. You didn't talk and you didn't flinch. You asked no questions and you told no tales. I wonder if you're like that now.' "'I don't know,' said I, slightly puzzled by his tone. I've made such a mess of my own affairs that I trust myself about as little as I'm likely to be trusted by anybody else. Yet I never in my life went back on a friend. I will say that. Otherwise, perhaps, I mightn't be in such a hole tonight. Exactly, said Raffles, nodding to himself, as though in assent to some hidden train of thought. Exactly what I remember of you. And I'll bet it's as true now as it was ten years ago. We don't alter, Bunny. We only develop. I suppose neither you nor I are really altered since you used to let down that rope, and I used to come up it hand over hand. You would stick at nothing for a pal, what? At nothing in this world, I was pleased to cry. Not even at a crime, said Raffles, smiling. I stopped to think, for his tone had changed, and I felt sure he was chaffing me. Yet his eyes seemed as much in earnest as ever, and for my part I was in no mood for reservations. No, not even at that, I declared. Name your crime and I'm your man. He looked at me, one moment in wonder and another moment in doubt, then turned the matter off with a shake of his head and the little cynical laugh that was all his own. You're a nice chap, Bunny. A real desperate character, what? Suicide one moment, and any crime I like the next. What you want is a drag, my boy, and you did well to come to a decent law-abiding citizen with a reputation to lose. None the less, we must have that money to-night, by hook or crook. To-night, Raffles? The sooner the better. Every hour after ten o'clock to-morrow morning is an hour of risk. Let one of those checks get round to your own bank, and you and it are dishonoured together. No, we must raise the wind to-night, and reopen your account first thing to-morrow, and I rather think I know where the wind can be raised. At two o'clock in the morning? Yes. But how, but where, at such an hour? From a friend of mine here in Bond Street. He must be a very intimate friend. Intimate's not the word. I have the run of his place and a latch-key all to myself. And you would knock him up at this hour of the night? If he's in bed. And it's essential that I should go in with you? Absolutely. Then I must. But I'm bound to say I don't like the idea, Raffles. Do you prefer the alternative? Asked my companion with a sneer. No, hang it, that's unfair. He cried apologetically in the same breath. I quite understand. It's a beastly ordeal but it would never do for you to stay outside. I tell you what, you shall have a peg before we start, just one. There's the whiskey, here's a siphon. I'll be putting on an overcoat while you help yourself. 
Well, I dare say I did so with some freedom, for this plan of his was not the less distasteful to me from its apparent inevitability. I must own, however, that it possessed fewer terrors before my glass was empty. Meanwhile, Raffles rejoined me, with a covert coat over his blazer, and a soft felt hat set carelessly on the curly head he shook with a smile as I passed him the decanter. "'When we come back,' said he, "'work first, play afterward. Do you see what day it is?' he added, tearing a leaflet from a Shakespearean calendar as I drained my glass. "'March 15th. The Ides of March, the Ides of March, remember. Eh, Bunny, my boy? You won't forget them, will you?' And with a laugh he threw some coals on the fire before turning down the gas like a careful householder. So we went out together, as the clock on the chimney-piece was striking two. Part Two Piccadilly was a trench of raw white fog, rimmed with blurred street-lamps, and lined with a thin coating of adhesive mud. We met no other wayfarers on the deserted flagstones, and were ourselves favoured with a very hard stare from the constable of the beat, who, however, touched his helmet on recognising my companion. "'You see, I'm known to the police,' laughed Raffles as we passed on. "'Poor devils! They've got to keep their weather-eye open on a night like this. A fog may be a bore to you and me, Bunny, but it's a perfect godsend to the criminal classes, especially so late in their season. Here we are, though I'm hanged if the beggar isn't in bed and asleep after all.' We had turned into Bond Street, and had halted on the curb a few yards down on the right. Raffles was gazing up at some windows across the road, windows barely discernible through the mist, and without the glimmer of a light to throw them out. They were over a jeweller's shop, as I could see by the peephole in the shop door, and the bright light burning within. But the entire upper part, with the private street door next the shop, was black and blank as the sky itself. "'Better give it up for to-night,' I urged. "'Surely the morning will be time enough.' "'Not a bit of it,' said Raffles. "'I have his key. We'll surprise him. Come along.' And seizing my right arm, he hurried me across the road, opened the door with his latch-key, and in another moment had shut it swiftly but softly behind us. We stood together in the dark. Outside a measured step was approaching. We had heard it through the fog as we crossed the street. Now, as it drew nearer, my companion's fingers tightened on my arm. "'It may be the chap himself,' he whispered. "'He's the devil of a night-bird. Not a sound, Bunny. We'll startle the life out of him.' "'Ah!' The measured step had passed without a pause. Raffles drew a deep breath, and his singular grip of me slowly relaxed. "'But still, not a sound,' he continued in the same whisper. "'We'll take a rise out of him, wherever he is. Slip off your shoes and follow me.' "'Well, you may wonder at my doing so, but you can never have met A. J. Raffles. Half his power lay in a conciliating trick of sinking the commander in the leader, and it was impossible not to follow one who led with such a zest. You might question, but you followed first. So now, when I heard him kick off his own shoes, I did the same, and was on the stair at his heels before I realized what an extraordinary way this was of approaching a stranger for money in the dead of night. But obviously Raffles and he were on exceptional terms of intimacy, and I could not but infer that they were in the habit of playing practical jokes upon each other. We groped our way so slowly upstairs that I had time to make more than one note before we reached the top. The stair was uncarpeted. The spread fingers of my right hand encountered nothing on the damp wall. Those of my left trailed through a dust that could be felt on the banisters. An eerie sensation had been upon me since we entered the house. It increased with every step we climbed. What hermit were we going to startle in his cell? We came to a landing. The banister led us to the left, and to the left again. Four steps more, and we were on another and a longer landing, and suddenly a match blazed from the black. I never heard it struck. Its flash was blinding. 
when my eyes became accustomed to the light, there was Raffles holding up the match with one hand, and shading it with the other, between bare boards, stripped walls, and the open doors of empty rooms. "'Where have you brought me?' I cried. "'The house is unoccupied.' "'Hush! Wait!' he whispered, and he led the way into one of the empty rooms. His match went out as we crossed the threshold, and he struck another without the slightest noise. Then he stood with his back to me, fumbling with something that I could not see. But when he threw the second match away, there was some other light in its stead, and a slight smell of oil. I stepped forward to look over his shoulder, but before I could do so he had turned and flashed a tiny lantern in my face. "'What's this?' I gasped. "'What rotten trick are you going to play?' "'It's played,' he answered, with his quiet laugh. "'On me?' "'I'm afraid so, Bunny.' "'Is there no one in the house, then?' "'No one but ourselves.' "'So it was mere chaff about your friend in Bond Street who could let us have that money?' "'Not altogether. It's quite true that Danby is a friend of mine.' "'Danby?' "'The jeweller underneath.' "'What do you mean?' I whispered, trembling like a leaf as his meaning dawned upon me. "'Are we to get money from the jeweller?' "'Well, not exactly.' "'What, then?' "'The equivalent. From his shop.' There was no need for another question. I understood everything but my own density. He had given me a dozen hints, and I had taken none. And there I stood, staring at him in that empty room, and there he stood, with his dark lantern, laughing at me. "'A burglar?' I gasped. "'You? You?' "'I told you I lived by my wits.' "'Why couldn't you tell me what you were going to do? Why couldn't you trust me? Why must you lie?' I demanded, piqued to the quick for all my horror. "'I wanted to tell you,' said he. "'I was on the point of telling you more than once. You may remember how I sounded you out about crime, though you have probably forgotten what you said yourself.' I didn't think you meant it at the time, but I thought I'd put you to the test. Now I see you didn't, and I don't blame you. I only am to blame. Get out of it, my dear boy, as quick as you can. Leave it to me. You won't give me away, whatever else you do. Oh, his cleverness, his fiendish cleverness! Had he fallen back on threats, coercion, sneers, all might have been different even yet but he set me free to leave him in the lurch. He would not blame me. He did not even bind me to secrecy. He trusted me. He knew my weakness and my strength, and was playing on both with his master's touch. "'Not so fast,' said I. "'Did I put this into your head, or were you going to do it in any case?' "'Not in any case,' said Raffles. "'It's true. I've had the key for days.' But when I won tonight, I thought of chucking it, for as a matter of fact, it's not a one-man job. That settles it. I'm your man. You mean it? Yes, for tonight. Good old Bunny, he murmured, holding the lantern for one moment to my face. The next he was explaining his plans, and I was nodding, as though we had been fellow cracksmen all our days. I know the shop, he whispered because I've got a few things there. I know this upper part, too. It's been to let for a month, and I got an order to view, and took a cast of the key before using it. The one thing I don't know is how to make a connection between the two. At present there's none. We may make it up here, though I rather fancy the basement myself. If you wait a minute I'll tell you." He set his lantern on the floor, crept to a back window, and opened it with scarcely a sound only to return shaking his head, after shutting the window with the same care. "'That was our one chance,' said he. "'A back window above a back window, but it's too dark to see anything, and we daren't show an outside light. Come down after me to the basement, and remember, though there's not a soul on the premises, you can't make too little noise. There, there, listen to that.' It was the measured tread that we had heard before on the flagstone outside. Raffles darkened his lantern, 
and again we stood motionless till it had passed. "'Either a policeman,' he muttered, "'or a watchman that all of these jewellers run between them. The watchman's the man for us to watch. He's simply paid to spot this kind of thing.' We crept very gingerly down the stairs, which creaked a bit in spite of us, and we picked up our shoes in the passage, then down some narrow stone steps, at the foot of which Raffles showed his light, and put on his shoes once more, bidding me do the same in a rather louder tone than he had permitted himself to employ overhead. We were now considerably below the level of the street, in a small space with as many doors as it had sides. Three were ajar, and we saw through them into empty cellars, but in the fourth a key was turned and a bolt drawn, and this one presently led us out into the bottom of a deep, square well of fog. A similar door faced it across this area, and Raffles had the lantern close against it and was hiding the light with his body, when a short and sudden crash made my heart stand still. Next moment I saw the door wide open, and Raffles standing within beckoning me with a jimmy. "'Door number one he whispered. Deuce knows how many more there'll be, but I know of two at least. We won't have to make much noise over them either. Down here there's less risk. We were now at the bottom of the exact fellow to the narrow stone stair on which we had just descended, the yard or well, being the one part common to both the private and the business premises. But this flight led to no open passage. Instead, a singularly solid mahogany door confronted us at the top. "'I thought so,' muttered Raffles, handing me the lantern, and pocketing a bunch of skeleton keys after tampering for a few minutes with the lock. "'It'll be an hour's work to get through that.' "'Can't you pick it?' "'No, I know these locks. It's no use trying. We must cut it out. And it'll take us an hour.' It took us forty-seven minutes by my watch or rather it took Raffles, and never in my life have I seen anything more deliberately done. My part was simply to stand by with the dark lantern in one hand and a small bottle of rock oil in the other. Raffles had produced a pretty embroidered case, intended obviously for his razors, but filled instead with the tools of his secret trade, including the rock oil. From this case he selected a bit, capable of drilling a hole an inch in diameter, and fitted it to a small but very strong steel brace. Then he took off his covert coat and his blazer, spread them neatly on the top step, knelt on them, turned up his shirt cuffs, and went to work with brace and bit near the keyhole. But first he oiled the bit to minimize the noise, and this he did invariably before beginning a fresh hole, and often in the middle of one. It took thirty-two separate borings to cut around that lock. I noticed that through the first circular orifice Raffles thrust a forefinger. Then, as the circle became an ever-lengthening oval, he got his hand through up to the thumb, and I heard him swear softly to himself. I was afraid so. What is it? An iron gate on the other side. How on earth are we to get through that? I asked in dismay. Pick the lock. But there may be two. In that case they'll be top and bottom and we shall have two fresh holes to make, as the door opens inwards. It won't open two inches as it is. I confess I did not feel sanguine about the lock-picking, seeing that one lock had baffled us already, and my disappointment and impatience must have been a revelation to me had I stopped to think. The truth is that I was entering into our nefarious undertakings with an involuntary zeal of which I was myself quite unconscious at the time. The romance and peril of the whole proceeding held me spellbound and entranced. My moral sense and my sense of fear were stricken by a common paralysis, and there I stood, shining my light and holding my file with a keener interest than I had ever brought to any honest avocation. And there knelt A. J. Raffles with his black hair tumbled, and the same watchful, quiet, determined half-smile with which I have seen him send down over after over in a county match. At last the chain of holes was complete, the lock wrenched out bodily, 
and a splendid bare arm plunged up to the shoulder through the aperture and through the bars of the iron gate beyond. "'Now,' whispered Raffles, "'if there's only one lock it'll be in the middle. "'Joy, here it is. "'Only let me pick it and we're through at last.' He withdrew his arm, a skeleton key was selected from a bunch, and then back went his arm to the shoulder. It was a breathless moment. I heard the heart throbbing in my body, the very watch ticking in my pocket, and ever and anon the tinkle-tinkle of the skeleton key. Then, at last, there came a single unmistakable click. In another minute the mahogany door and the iron gate yawned behind us, and Raffles was sitting on an office table, wiping his face, with the lantern throwing a steady beam by his side. We were now in a bare and roomy lobby behind the shop, but separated therefrom by an iron curtain, the very sight of which filled me with despair. Raffles, however, did not appear in the least depressed, but hung up his coat and hat on some pegs in the lobby, before examining this curtain with his lantern. "'That's nothing,' said he, after a minute's inspection. We'll be through that in no time, but there's a door on the other side which may give us trouble. Another door? I groaned. And how do you mean to tackle this thing? Prize it up with the jointed jimmy. The weak point of these iron curtains is the leverage you can get from below. But it makes a noise. And this is where you're coming in, Bunny. This is where I couldn't do without you. I must have you overhead to knock through when the street is clear. I'll come with you and show a light. Well, you may imagine how little I liked the prospect of this lonely vigil, and yet there was something very stimulating in the vital responsibility which it involved. Hitherto I had been a mere spectator. Now I was to take part in the game, and the fresh excitement made me more than ever insensible to those considerations of conscience and of safety which were already as dead nerves in my breast. So I took my post without a murmur in the front room above the shop. The fixtures had been left for the refusal of the incoming tenant, and fortunately for us they included Venetian blinds which were already down. It was the simplest matter in the world to stand peeping through the lathes into the street, to beat twice with my foot when anybody was approaching, and once when all was clear again. The noises that even I could hear below with the exception of one metallic crash at the beginning, were indeed incredibly slight. But they ceased altogether at each double rap from my toe, and a policeman passed quite half a dozen times beneath my eyes, and the man whom I took to be the jeweller's watchman oftener still, during the better part of an hour that I spent at the window. Once, indeed, my heart was in my mouth, but only once. It was when the watchman stopped and peered through the peephole into the lighted shop. I waited for his whistle. I waited for the gallows or the jail. But my signal had been studiously obeyed, and the man passed on in undisturbed serenity. In the end, I had a signal in my turn, and retraced my steps with lighted matches down the broad stairs, down the narrow ones, across the area, and up into the lobby where Raffles awaited me with an outstretched hand. "'Well done, my boy,' said he. You're the same good man in a pinch, and you shall have your reward. I've got a thousand pounds worth if I've got a penneth. It's all in my pockets. And here's something else I found in this locker. Very decent port and some cigars. Meant for poor dear Danby's business friends. Take a pull and you shall light up presently. I've found a lavatory, too, and we must have a wash and brush up before we go, for I'm as black as your boot." The iron curtain was down, but he insisted on raising it until I could peep through the glass door on the other side and see his handiwork in the shop beyond. Here two electric lights were left burning all night, and in their cold white rays I could at first see nothing amiss. I looked along an orderly lane, an empty glass counter on my left, glass cupboards of untouched silver on my right, and facing me, the filmy black eye of the peephole that shone like a stage moon on the street. The counter had not been emptied by Raffles. Its contents were in the Chubb safe, which he had given up at a glance. Nor had he looked at the silver, except to choose a cigarette case for me. 
he had confined himself entirely to the shop window. This was in three compartments, each secured for the night by removable panels with separate locks. Raffles had removed them a few hours before their time, and the electric light shone on a corrugated shutter bare as the ribs of an empty carcass. Every article of value was gone from the one place which was invisible from the little window in the door. Elsewhere, all was as it had been left overnight. And but for a train of mangled doors behind the iron curtain, a bottle of wine and a cigar-box, with which liberties had been taken, a rather black towel in the lavatory, a burnt match here and there, and our finger-marks on the dusty banisters, not a trace of our visit did we leave. "'Had it in my head for long?' said Raffles, as we strolled through the streets towards dawn, for all the world as though we were returning from a dance. "'No, Bunny. I never thought of it, till I saw that upper part empty about a month ago, and bought a few things in the shop to get the lie of the land. That reminds me that I never paid for them, but by Jove I will to-morrow. And if that isn't poetic justice, what is? One visit showed me the possibilities of the place but a second convinced me of its impossibilities without a pal. So I had practically given up the idea, when you came along on the very night and in the very plight for it. But here we are at the Albany, and I hope there's some fire left. For I don't know how you feel, Bunny, but for my part I'm as cold as Keats's owl. He could think of Keats on his way from a felony. He could hanker for his fireside like another. Floodgates were loosed within me and the plain English of our adventure rushed over me as cold as ice. Raffles was a burglar. I had helped him to commit one burglary. Therefore I was a burglar, too. Yet I could stand and warm myself by his fire, and watch him empty his pockets, as though we had done nothing wonderful or wicked. My blood froze, my heart sickened, my brain whirled. How I had liked this villain! How I had admired him! Now my liking and admiration must turn to loathing and disgust. I waited for the change. I longed to feel it in my heart, but I longed and I waited in vain. I saw that he was emptying his pockets. The table sparkled with their hoard. Rings by the dozen, diamonds by the score. Bracelets, pendants, aigrettes, necklaces, pearls, rubies, amethysts, sapphires— and diamonds always, diamonds in everything, flashing bayonets of light, dazzling me, blinding me, making me disbelieve because I could no longer forget. Last of all came no gem indeed, but my own revolver from an inner pocket, and that struck a chord. I suppose I said something. My hand flew out. I can see Raffles now as he looked at me once more with a high arch over each clear eye, I can see him pick out the cartridges with his quiet, cynical smile, before he would give me my pistol back again. "'You mayn't believe it, Bunny,' said he, "'but I never carried a loaded one before. On the whole, I think it gives one confidence. Yet it would be very awkward if anything went wrong. One might use it. And that's not the game at all.' though I have often thought that the murderer who has just done the trick must have great sensations before things get too hot for him. Don't look so distressed, my dear chap. I've never had those sensations, and I don't suppose I ever shall. But this much you have done before? said I hoarsely. Before? My dear Bunny, you offend me. Did it look like a first attempt? Of course I have done it before. Often? Well, no. Not often enough to destroy the charm, at all events. Never, as a matter of fact, unless I'm cursedly hard up. Did you hear about the Thimbley Diamonds? Well, that was the last time, and a poor lot of paste they were. Then there was the little business of the Dormer House boat at Henley last year. That was mine also, such as it was. I never brought off a really big coup yet. When I do, I shall chuck it up. Yes, I remembered both cases very well. To think that he was their author. It was incredible, outrageous, inconceivable. Then my eyes would fall upon the table, 
twinkling and glittering in a hundred places, and incredulity was at an end. "'How came you to begin?' I asked, as curiosity overcame mere wonder, and a fascination for his career gradually wove itself into my fascination for the man. "'Ah, that's a long story,' said Raffles. "'It was in the colonies when I was out there playing cricket. It's too long a story to tell you now, but I was in much the same fix that you were in to-night, and it was my only way out. I never meant it for anything more, but I'd tasted blood, and it was all over with me. Why should I work when I could steal? Why settle down to some humdrum, uncongenial billet, when excitement, romance, danger, and a decent living were all going begging together? Of course, it's very wrong. But we can't all be moralists. And the distribution of wealth is very wrong to begin with. Besides, you're not at it all the time. I'm sick of quoting Gilbert's lines to myself, but they're profoundly true. I only wonder if you'll like the life as much as I do. Like it! I cried out. Not I! It's no life for me. Once is enough. You wouldn't give me a hand another time? Don't ask me, Raffles. Don't ask me, for God's sake. Yet you said you would do anything for me. You asked me to name my crime. But I knew at the time you didn't mean it. You didn't go back on me to-night, and that ought to satisfy me, goodness knows. I suppose I'm ungrateful and unreasonable and all that. I ought to let it end at this. But you're the very man for me, Bunny, the very man. Just think how we got through to-night. Not a scratch, not a hitch. There's nothing very terrible in it, you see. There never would be, while we work together. He was standing in front of me with a hand on either shoulder. He was smiling as he knew so well how to smile. I turned on my heel, planted my elbows on the chimney-piece and my burning head between my hands. Next instant a still hardier hand fell on my back. All right, my boy. You are quite right, and I'm worse than wrong. I'll never ask it again. Go if you want to. And come again about midday for the cash. There was no bargain, but of course I'll get you out of your scrape, especially after the way you've stood by me to-night. I was round again with my blood on fire. I'll do it again, I said through my teeth. He shook his head. Not you, he said, smiling quite good-humouredly on my insane enthusiasm. I will, I cried with an oath. I'll lend you a hand as often as you like. What does it matter now? I've been in it once. I'll be in it again. I've gone to the devil anyhow. I can't go back and wouldn't if I could. Nothing matters another rap. When you want me, I'm your man. And that is how Raffles and I— joined felonious forces on the Ides of March. End of The Ides of March